I have with me this morning uh, Dr. Bill Stevens. And uh, I'm 96. There's a saying at that age that it's, these are the golden years. Don't believe it. <laughs> these are the rusty years. Now, I, my talk is prepared in the Canadian idiom. I believe, however, that it has uh, international adaptability. And uh, I ask you to bear with me. Um, I thought a few days ago, because I haven't spoken for about six years, that I better read this address out loud. And to my dismay, I lost my voice about halfway through. So that's why Bill is here. He's going to whip in if I fade out. I wanted to speak on establishing a sustainable economy because as you would gather, someone like myself has traveled a great deal uh, in the agricultural field internationally. And for some beyond the realm of agricultural research and production, it may seem unusual that a boy would develop a lifelong commitment to food production as his niche in society. And I address you from that perspective. Mahatma Gandhi said that the earth provides enough for everyone's needs, but not for everyone's greed. The West's model, adapted globally, will fail to feed the world, for it will destroy resources and the traditional farmers who possess the knowledge, the experience, and especially the will to produce food. We must engage human capital in the task of adaptation that confronts us. Wise regulation of return on investment will be required to sustain the form of human society that lies ahead. FAO defines sustainability using multiple indicators, namely environmental integrity, economic resilience, social well-being, and good governance. Sustainable development is attained when current generations could meet their needs without undermining or destroying future generations' chances of having their needs met. That's from the United Nations. Modifying the system will not be easy but will be facilitated by governments recognizing the unique value of food and the associated agrobio resources plus human resources, then enacting appropriate legislation, much as is done in the time of extreme acts of God or war. Present animal production systems can be antagonistic to an energy infinite resource constrained future. Technical tweets, utilizing new vaccines, food additives, genetic engineering, and various technologies alone will not solve the issue. Fundamental change within the system is imperative. Today, the food chain answers to the market. This has nurtured globalization, intensified production units, patenting of agro-business innovations, and place decision-taking with those controlling capital and whose mandate is return on investment. This thrust is clearly unsustainable, yet we are offering this model to countries that are under development. Sound husbandry practices are imperative across all aspects of animal and crop production. Computerized procedures offer complementary controls, but will never be a substitute 
for the disciplines inherent in traditional husbandry management. Similarly, with large concentrations of livestock and poultry production, we're dangerously, dangerously exposed to extreme acts of God and pestilence. Nor can we continue to expose the food chain to the dictates of the so-called marketplace and the relatively unschooled and apparently uncaring 1%. Recently, large tracts of 100,000 hectares and more of soya beans under one ownership have been planted on newly cleared land in Brazil. The resulting glut in the world market collapsed the soybean market, destroying many small producers worldwide. The sequel, not unnaturally, also rendered some of the perpetrators bankrupt and out of production, sending soybean prices soaring again, with resulting increased economic stress for the already undernourished. Yet, some seem poised to inflict this imperfect model on Africa. Its population, according to UN projections, will double to 2.5 billion by 2050. The World Bank, given present trends, projects more arid conditions in sub-Saharan Africa will render present corn varieties there unsuitable for planting, both hybrid and the GMO varieties of corn seed are on offer. Crop yields are low because generations of subsistent farming have left soil to a great extent depleted of essential nutrients. This will require judicious use of fertilizer to prevent runoff into already precarious water supply for humans and animals. The notorious lack of adequate infrastructure for movement and storage within Africa, coupled with a long history of corruption and conflict, must be factored into a solution that aims at food self-sufficiency for Africa's multitudes. More than 60 years of traveling the world and an increasingly close association with many aspects of food food production has served to raise my personal awareness of how fragile and cyclical the world food chain is. We have a classic race against time to which few pay attention. It seems to be human nature to not act decisively on questions of human survival unless and until we are forced to do so by an event of catastrophic magnitude. We have major problems stemming from population growth, depletion of finite resources, environmental degradation, and in many cases, destruction, and also in some countries, poor checks and balances to assure food surf safety. Except in the densely populated areas, the major problem we face is indifference because of the existing regional abundance. Governments are ever ready to take advantage of voter apathy. In consequence, many industrialized countries do not have an investment worthy of the name in food and health sciences, which the future will require. Nor do the industrialized countries recognize that for their own future security, they must commit to helping find an enduring solution to the chronic food shortages present in too many disadvantaged regions. Surely some of us are beginning to think that terrorism is not entirely based on religious differences. Today, the world we populate is dominated by a series of, uh, by issues of universal significance population growth, migration, terrorism, and regional disparity on a grand scale. Then climate change, perhaps more accurately defined as climate disruption 
or global transformation that endangers water and food security, the preservation of biodiversity, and even human survival. We seek sustainable economic growth. This automatically implies a lowering of expectations, together with a greater concern on the part of the so-called advanced countries for the welfare of an increasing number of the impoverished states. International communications are instant. No walls or gated communities can be built that will conceal wanton indulgence. In a world of declining supplies of finite resources, we are in need of enhanced scientific discovery. Funding this should be one of our most compelling pursuits, much as we regard support for favorite charity. We must strive mightily to eliminate waste through utilizing all byproducts and do so in a way that requires minimum energy. In short, our discoveries need to provide solutions without unintended consequences. There isn't an alternative presently known to man that will safeguard the well-being of our grandchildren. Short of immediate coordinated reductions in CO2 emissions to levels that will assure human survival. The economics of the so-called marketplace alone will not be able to accomplish this, for it is truly a Churchillian undertaking. We can achieve timely downsizing given that standard of leadership. We are seeing the melting of ice sheets in the Arctic. Loss of ice cover reduces the ability of the Earth's surface to reflect heat. Columbia University's Earth Observatory says that vast ice sheet surfaces in Greenland have been getting darker and less reflective of the sun, helping to accelerate the melting of ice and fueling sea level rises. This process is turning Greenland into a storer rather than a reflector of solar energy. Also, higher wind strengths linked to climate change, and we've seen that recently out in the Atlantic, result in the decreasing ability of oceans to absorb CO2. If such dynamics cannot be brought under universal control, then the Earth's climate will become increasingly volatile with altered patterns of wind, rainfall, and ocean circulation. This would surely spell catastrophe for all forms of life. When I was born in 1920, the world population was 1.9 billion. This year, it is expected to reach 7.2 billion. Current annual growth is 87 million, or the equivalent of nearly three Canadas. In my lifetime, the world population has more than trebled. To add another dimension to this discussion, I sought FAO statistics in animal populations. These cover a 43-year uh, period, 1970-2013. Ruminants increased 31%, chickens 300%, turkeys 169%, swine 178. Except for the ruminants, humans, farm animals, and household pets compete for much the same foodstuffs. The truth is that we have no experience of functioning long-term meeting the demands of a world population of even today's 7.2 billion. Early pressures are being felt from both China and India, where their vast populations are increasing consumption of meat-based diets, and thus requires uh, even more land and water devoted to growing crops. 
Dr. Alan Bernstein, President and CEO of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, in this year's uh, Massey Talk, defined science as simply the best way humanity has come up with for understanding our world. A book review this year in one of Canada's prominent magazines states, many scientists whose work does not involve either the space program or some kind of weaponry subsist on a pittance and lead a precarious financial life. The less flashy scientific disciplines rarely get their due. Nobel awards are occasionally directed to eminent scientists, but do not compare in the slightest with compensation lavished on so-called celebrity athletes and entertainers. Tenure is controversial in some quarters and doesn't necessarily provide the incentive we seek. We must be creative in fashioning new forms of incentives and rewards for those in the sciences who are engaged in defining and implementing all aspects of progressive scientific endeavors related to establish, establishing and maintaining sustainable economic development. The chief medical officer for England reports 100,000 people are dying every year in Europe and the US from infections that antibiotics have lost the power to treat. That's your line of work, Bob. The Longitude Prize, $11.5 million, awaits the first individual or team that develops a quick, cheap, and reliable way of stopping overuse and misuse of antibiotics. This kind of incentive deserves many replications across the whole endeavor of quickly moving to a sustainable economic model. A prize is just one way to encourage science attuned to our urgent needs. Stanford University reminds us that with respect to crop productivity, drought resistance, and heat tolerance, the need for water is greatly magnified by every degree of average temperature increase. This is one of the weightiest problems we have to address in the food chain. Only by connecting all the dots can we come to some understanding of the knock-on effect of what is folding unfolding. We cannot expect market forces to pull a rabbit out of the hat or for the 1% to fully engage. Our fate rests with the genius of the scientific community. It possesses the knowledge and capacity to provide answers and alternatives. But we are without a commander-in-chief and supporting general staff to develop and deliver a strategy and urgent sequential implementation. Fortunately, there's not yet an overall supply crisis from our world resource base. What we do have is an ongoing acute and shameful crisis in terms of any coordinated multinational mechanism to achieve, to achieve humane distribution for regions in desperate need. The obligation is beyond the ability of NGOs to cope. It is deeply troubling that governments will invest vast sums for technology in the exploration of outer space, but cannot finance or manage the movement of food supplies from surplus to deficient areas. There's no question that the rapidly expanding world population will require more food to be produced. So we must not artificially hobble science that strives through new technology to meet these demands. This is not an issue. Government's challenge 
is to provide the means of testing new corporate discoveries on neutral ground and of proving or not their safety before they can be offered to the public. I doubt that there is a way around such a protocol. Staff and facilities, and facilities must be expanded to deal with the steady pressure for increased innovation in bringing safe new products to market. We know the green revolution fed the world. Twice as much grain is produced today compared to 70 years ago. But this growth required a threefold increase in water usage. We must concentrate on developing more drought resistant crops, improving efficiency in the use of rainfall, regardless of how much or how little, to help uh, fresh water, to halt fresh water depletion. Ultimately, large economies could collapse and conflict spread as water supplies fail to keep pace with development, forcing populations to abandon dry areas and migrate elsewhere. Today we are being overwhelmed by issues of worldwide significance, which need to be dealt with in a timely fashion for the common good. To achieve this outcome, we require a code of international governance, something that the United Nations has not yet been sufficiently focused to enact, much less dedicated and strong enough to enforce. Henceforth, governing can never again be business as usual. How well we cope will be dependent upon the quality of political leadership we insist represent and serve us. World agriculture is increasingly dependent on favorable weather to satisfy the demand of a growing population. It is the key random variable. University of Reading reports that corn production yields in France had quadrupled between 1960 and 2000. There was little improvement in the following decade, things plateaued. While the numbers of hot days had more than doubled in that period, they predict yield losses of up to 12% over the next 20 years for corn and up to 20% for wheat and soy because of higher temperatures. In the mid U.S. Midwest, higher temperatures by 2050 are predicted to reduce yields by 20% and by 2100 by over 60%. A recent University of Manitoba study states that the Canadian prairies could be among the most affected areas of the world over the next few decades. Presently, Canada ranks as the world's sixth agricultural country. So serious shortfall here uh, will certainly <coughs> impact overall food supply. In the USA, the National Water Research Institute was founded in California in 1991 to promote protection, maintenance, and restoration of water supplies, and to protect the fresh water and marine environments through the development of cooperative research work. In 1993, to honor the Institute's founder, an annual Clark Prize lecture and awards ceremony was established as one of the most prestigious awards in the world consisting of a medallion and $50,000. It is given annually to recognize research accomplishments that solve real world water problems and to highlight the importance and need to fund this type of research. According to the abstract from which I've just been quoting, the 2015 recipient, Dr. Crittenden, 
the Georgia Institute of Technology, states it is essential to find alternative chemicals and approaches to keep harmful chemicals from ever being used in commerce. He is focused on eliminating contaminants rather than just treating them. Water is essential to support sustainable human development and activities. We all know this. It is used virtually for everything. But more water is used for energy, agriculture, industry, and transportation than for personal use. Consequently, the sustainability of our water resources is linked to the practices used to generate energy, produce food, provide transportation, and manage land. Internationally, the consequences of climate change have been examined in a cursory way at conferences in Durban, Stockholm, Copenhagen, and most recently, Paris. At government levels, there seems to be a growing sense that major changes are needed in how we manage the reality of humanity's situation over the next three to four decades. But present deadlines for action fall far short of the timelines required. Among the general public, there is a big realization that something is amiss with respect to achieving sustainable economic development. Yet we naively expect that somewhere, some folks must be working to reach this goal. So we'll leave it to them. And anyway, why should my country be involved in this pursuit when countries X, Y, and Z pay no heed? Joseph Stiglitz, renowned Nobel-winning economist, observes that in the US, 91% of all the gains post 2008, our last recession, went to the 1%. Those at the very top aren't spending their money. People at the bottom, on the other hand, spend all their money just, just to get by. So total demand weakens, as does total growth. There is a contention that the people at the top are the job creators. And if they are taxed at higher rates, they won't create the jobs. That just doesn't stand up. The fact is that wherever there is demand, jobs are created and entrepreneurship flourishes. The top tax rate post-war in the USA was 91% under Eisenhower. During this period, there was stability and never a financial crisis. During the Reagan era, the upper tax rate was lowered from the 91% to below 30%, and the economy was largely deregulated. The result is what we now see, more instability, and since deregulation, one financial crisis after another. Dr. Stiglitz, Stiglitz concludes, an economy which doesn't deliver for the majority of its citizens decade after decade is a failing economy. Most governments agreed early this century at international conferences that by 2030, the world's steadily rising average temperature must be arrested at no more than a further two degrees Celsius increase over the pre-industrial level to prevent the disastrous outcome. We are more than halfway there now. Let us assume that we will succeed in stabilizing the temperature rise at two degrees Celsius by 2030. Some entities should be protecting, projecting what will happen on several fronts in the meantime. For example, the extent of rising ocean levels and likely consequences on world food production and human displacement 
population growth and civil unrest, apropos the entrenched 1%. Release of methane gas from thawing permafrost, which is 23 times more effective in raising global temperature than CO2. Copper and lithium supplies are in decline. Phosphorus, a key ingredient for agriculture generally, at the current rate of use, is unlikely to last until the end of the century. Little time remains in which to identify alternatives and then to bring them into production. In identifying substitutions, priority, priority must be given to those most likely to remain in good supply. I propose the creation of a senior cabinet post, second only to the prime minister, responsible for sustainable economic development and the sciences. He or she would firmly direct our national scientific activity with respect to sustainability, eliminating duplication, and managing the function of bureaucracy in areas where it lacks expertise and tends to simply delay and derail. I think that paragraph applies to all your countries. Then the creation of a non partisan sustainable commission reporting directly to this senior minister. It would be chaired by the country's chief scientist. The commission to network and liaise with equivalent bodies worldwide. To think also in terms of the international picture and interconnect aggressively. It must plan with insight and imagination and execute with the zeal of an entrepreneur. Short timelines meticulously met and rewarded accordingly. The Commission would tend to engage the nation properly in the fundamental aspects of national and international life and in a manner free from short-term political passions. It will provide the Minister with a series of sequential 10-year plans, initially three, which the Commission would constantly re review as new circumstances dictate. Modern science must be directed by the requirements of our altered climate and the rapid influence this will have on the habitability of our planet. Without determined action, we can expect to see the disappearance of Arctic sea ice, expanded deserts and water shortages in the subtropics, and increasing extreme weather events elsewhere when from Asia to the Andes long before 2030. We've had a spectacle just this past week. Every project identified for action by the Sustainable Commission in the 10-year plans should be assigned a reward component that covers all members of the re research team or teams. A form of reward might be a percent reduction in income tax for life. No one should be aghast at such a proposal. We live in an era where so-called celebrities are revered and are rewarded with an annual compensation often in the tens of millions, not to mention the not so revered 1% whose contribution to the well-being of humanity is difficult to quantify. These sustainable stewardship prizes to encourage overall citizen participation could be partially funded by lotteries and are in some countries. Canada cannot succeed in isolation but can set an example by charting a new course for ourselves and being prepared to share our findings freely with other countries. With our vast landmass, the issue of global climate change
can only be appropriately addressed with Canada's act of participation. We should be a catalyst for focused engagement. Such a commission for Canada to be scientifically oriented in its makeup with the chief scientist as chair, 14 members from academia, six members drawn from significant institutions of national governments, with power to add over time four to six more members from other sectors to bring strength and balance. The commission would have phased rotating membership. The sustainable commission's mandate requires it to identify and prioritize issues for urgent solutions over the next 20 to 30 years. Its members must be nonpartisan to maintain focus and endure achievable timelines. The objectives of the commission would be to establish scientific validation priorities for the vital elements in sustainability so we understand both the benefits and the downside of proposed actions before they become government policy. I believe that many of today's urgent challenges can be met with solutions we already know about or can quickly adapt and fine tune. That question is what are you and I going to do to enlist and support committed, qualified political leadership, prepared to set the course, budget wisely, then ably navigate through these tumultuous times. I've not been speaking doom and gloom, but rather have we the will to inform ourselves about the real pressing issues that will t transform our future, and to do so soon enough to exert a positive influence over humanity's destiny. Three quarters of the world's income, investments, and services, and nearly all its research facilities are concentrated in the hands of a quarter of its population. What is under indictment is no longer inequality, but the international system with its structures and mechanisms, for it surely works adversely against development in non-industrial countries. Most long-distance moving of goods and people will be centered in the future on emergency relief, hence the value of suggested infrastructure investments. Less concentration of industry is indicated in preparation for the risk of disruption from unpredictable extreme weather events. I was quite surprised to find Tulsa building this $5 billion plant in one section of the US. Our weather patterns are changing, and we're sitting ducks, and we do much more of that. In August 2016, the High Peace Center in Britain published its annual earnings survey on their 100 top companies in the stock exchange in London. Their CEOs enjoyed in one year a 10% increase over the previous year to an average of $7 million each. The CEOs of these companies now earn 120 times more, including pensions and bonuses, than their employees. And a year ago, the London School of Economics study advised that would be, there would be no adverse impact on the economy if these executive salaries were slashed. Oxfam reports that 62 industrialists now control more wealth than the bottom half of the world's population. <laughs> the global order in which you and I exist is more unfair than any previous society in 
history. We, would not, must, we should not give up on involving some of the 1% wholeheartedly to participate in the sustainable development and be part of the solution. It would be deeply rewarding if someone of Mr. Warren Buffett's stature would rally those of his own ilk in the funding of large infrastructure projects that are so urgently required in the impoverished regions of the world. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to curtail <coughs> mass migration. Even a small initial recruitment would inspire additional members among this group to bring the benefits of their resources and, and talents to fruition in solving issues of such international magnitude and significance. It's past time to merely describe the situation as something to be dealt with over time and corrected. There's an urgency to this crisis that most national governments are failing to convey. I'm old enough to remember the economic model of 1939 to 50, when we experienced a revolution in our social and economic attitudes. Confronted by a specter of being subjugated by a totalitarian regime, we concentrated on survival and winning. Cuts were made in resource use and consumption, while we mounted an enormous industrial effort, building tens of thousands of tanks, fighters, bombers, and ships. Food was rationed and scarce, but we ate a healthy fare. There were extensive energy restrictions, yet public acceptance of curved consumption was nurtured by having inspired leaders emerge. Lester Brown is the much respected founder and president of the Earth Policy Institute. Its purpose is to provide a plan for sustaining civilization. In his book, The World on Edge, which was published in 2010, he methodically outlines step by step how we must urgently restore the economy's material support system, reforesting the earth, protecting topsoil, re restoring rangelands and fisheries, stabilizing water tables. A basic goal is to accelerate the shift to smaller families and to halt the growth in the world population at 8 billion by 2040. This book outlines timelines for coordinated international action in moving forward. It is required reading for all world leaders. Lord Nicholas Stern, president of the British Academy, wrote a government climate change review in 26 and has recently updated this summary. He states we underestimated the potential importance of strong feedbacks, such as the thawing of the permafrost to release methane. And incidentally, the Russians recently have conceded that deer carcasses, as a result of an earlier huge anthrax epidemic, have thawed and the infection has emerged in the existing deer population. Lord Stern states that over the next 20 years, the world has the opportunity to embark along a better path of economic growth that gives much greater chance of managing climate change and overcoming poverty than the old carbon route. Meeting in Geneva in August of this year, the international, the intergovernmental scientific panel on climate change from the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research warned that keeping within the temperature rise limited agreed on in Paris will be extremely difficult to achieve. It will require 
closing down all coal-fired power plants across the planet by 2025, and by 2030, being rid of the combustion engine entirely. Fortunately, the mayors of the world's largest cities, realizing that they are still uh, on their own in dealing with climate change-induced emergencies, have banded together in an organization of city-states, now more than 60 cities strong, to share their knowledge and experiences. Collectively, these city-states represent more people than the largest country in the world. This movement was organized on the initiative of Ken Livingston, then Lower Mayor of London, and Michael Bloomberg, while Mayor of New York City. Mr. Bloomberg remains very active and is a tower of great strength internationally. He explains that city-states have already done a lot of what federal governments are promising. Mayors are closer to the ground, to the people, and to the solutions we need. Mark Kenney, Carney, head of the Financial Stability Board of Central Bankers, said the world didn't take climate change seriously as a sy systemic risk the way it does now. He has appointed a new global task force led by Mr. Bloomberg, mandated with improving how companies disclose the business risks they face due to climate change. In other words, do these companies have a strategy if they're sitting down in the valley? That's only one example. Without question, Messrs. Bloomberg and Carney are in the vanguard of the inspired leadership the world must have that I mentioned a few moments ago. Finally, the future human reality will be centered less on technology and industrial might than on food and water supply for all mankind. An Eastern philosopher observed, knowing the facts is easy. Knowing how to act based on the facts is difficult. As an old soldier, I'm eager to assist with the heavy lifting and urge you to join this crucial global crusade. Thank you. I always like being close to the Milar. That limits the questions. I think the fact that the uh, poultry population has grown so dramatically uh, in, in my lifetime is a partial answer to that because the industry is very efficient. Um, we're all going to have to tighten our belts a bit in, in what lies ahead, and we're reluctant to do that. We've had things in such great shape uh, throughout uh, our lifespan. Uh, I'm older than most of you, so I have some other memories of when times were not as great as they've been now. And, and of course, we're now entering the new era where the younger period people see much less opportunity. I don't know that I'm answering your, your question. I, th I think uh, the poultry industry has held up its uh, end very well. I was very pleased to see uh, the one thing I understood in, in Dr. Etch's uh, presentation, that uh, he had a perfect uh, leghorn male with a five sprig point head. <laughs> That's according to the standard of 
profession long since abandoned. Uh, it would be like committing Harry Carey for me to answer that. I think you know what I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, if I can just add this, uh, we, we can laugh uh, about some of these things, but uh, we are facing perhaps one of the most serious challenges ever in the history of mankind. <coughs> and um, we have military blocks opposite one another. And you can say, how are you ever going to bring these people together? Um, it may not be possible. But I think it should be enunciated for the benefit of all to know what is unfolding and that uh, science has the capability of finding many of the solutions. Whether the politicians uh, can fill the gap is, is another unfortunate question, but we may find circumstances teaming up so that they'll be nervous enough that they'll want to sit around the table. Bill and I were just talking on the way down uh, I did business in 94 countries, uh, and I traveled actively to them all many, many times. And I was touched by, without exception, finding cooperation wherever I went in the agricultural and food uh, producing community an exchanging of uh, secrets, even. The, I, I went to China in 1957, before it was fashionable to go there, and uh, established uh, both a meat and a layer program. Then the Cultural Revolution followed and everything got mixed. By, the meat birds were laying like layers, and the layers were laying like meat birds. Uh, but years later, a delegation led by the second top man in the country uh, came to Canada and to the United States. There were nine days in the US and four days in Canada. And uh, the, the, the leader was the uh, chairman of the Politburo, a very important individual. And uh, the minister, uh, Canadian Minister of Agriculture phoned me and said, we've got these folks that have just arrived in Canada, and they definitely, we had a program for them, but they definitely want to come to Cambridge to see you. Uh, can you receive them tomorrow? <laughs> so we did. Uh, my wife was very good at this, and we entertained them in our home. There were 12 of them. And uh, the leader had six little bags of grain. A little, be about a uh, <laughs> couple of hundred grams in these bags. And uh, there was maize and wheat, uh, soybeans. Uh, barley, uh, two or three, there were six different kinds. And after my wife had served them dinner, they would go around the house and knock on the walls to see, see whether they were hollow or not. And they were intrigued with uh, uh, dishwashers and uh, clothes dryers and things like that. And they actually took some of them home with them. Uh, on their plane, but he, he said, uh, we've a, a gift for you, and uh, it's in, it's acknowledging the, the help you gave us years ago. 
all of this seed was drought resistant. It carried the gene for drought resistance. And they had it, I, I don't know, they, I wasn't the last person they visited, but they probably hadn't set out to bring it to me. But they had not found anybody that would understand the value, uh, uh, the way I did, of, of what we were getting. And I tell that story because uh, uh, we've got a lot of drought-resistant grains in Canada that we didn't have before. They went to Lethbridge. So there's cooperation uh, in, in agriculture in many ways we wouldn't expect. Well, they're all getting hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you, Don, for uh, <laughs>